Cool. So um, I had one of my students who've been studying me for a really long time. He was like, do you start with like, like an oval for the head? Um, or do you start in like with the details? And the, my answer to that is, you know, you kind of wish you could do both simultaneously. Um, so if we look at the whole picture, um, this is a drawing that was on a small sheet of paper. Um, you can see like, if I drop it down, there's barely any extra hair. Um, and then it basically goes to just like the collar. So it's like a really small sheet and it's done in silver point, um, which is basically you prepare a paper, um, you put like a special coating on it and you actually, you have a piece of silver um, that's like in a cord. Um, and then you can scrape onto um, the prepared paper. Um, a lot of times today, if you buy the paper, you can buy paint that you can paint onto the paper, but you can also buy the paper prepared. And um, I had a bunch of my friends that they would have earrings, like silver backed earrings, and they would actually take the earring and like strap it to the end of a pencil. And then they would, you know, like they would draw with that, like with like super strong, uh, I guess that was glue or something, but the an earring, like a silver earring backing, you know, works for the draw. You can also buy, um, you know, cords that are designed for it. It's a really delicate and it's a really beautiful, um, very Renaissance. Um, all right, Kristen, you're gonna have to go down babe, to get that bacon before it burns. Um, so anyway, it's a really special form of drawing and this picture's in black and white. So it lends itself really nicely to graphite. Um, so the concepts of drawing are exactly the same. I just wanted to talk about like silver point for a little bit because it is, um, if you ever do have the opportunity um, to, to draw like that, it's, it's really nice. Um, all right, so back to the original question. Do we start with the oval um, or do we start with the details? And um, because of the zoom and the nature of the zoom and because I find it um, comforting, um, I'm gonna draw um, basically what amounts to like a hockey mask. Um, so I'm not drawing any of the details of the side of the face, um, but I, I am imagining like if it was a mask, like coming up this side, um, and then maybe I'll close it off here, like just to like cover the front of the face, even if it was like a, um, oh my gosh, I never thought about that, but like if there was like a, uh, one of those masks that you that people put on their faces for like like a like to help their skin or something um you know they're like little you know the people look like it looks scary when they, you're wearing it but it just it fits in your face it, i'm kind of drawing like the shape of what that um mask might look like um and then you know so i know the silhouette of the face is here which is along here and I'm coming up along this side, which is along this side. So I kind of have a sense of where the chin is. Um, and then I'm kind of seeing like where the hairline is. Like, I know the hair comes down below like the forehead. You know, if you pull your hair back, you can see like the hairline. This, uh, this angel's got some bangs. So um, I'm just generally putting the top of the mask up here and we'll anticipate the, uh, you know, some of the hair coming down and some of these tufts or whatever. Um, and then the main thing that we're looking for is this space between the eyes, which is of course the keystone. And because I took all the rest of them off, they're almost done. Did you put them in the foil? Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Um, and the keystone makes sort of a Y shape. Um, the keystone gives us the inside of the eye socket. And then it's gonna lead us into the eyebrows. Oh yes. <clears throat> um, the keystone also lets us go down the bridge of the nose. So I'm in this convenient place where, you know, my angle, the paper, I mean, my drawing is so close to the paper, but you can actually put your, I, I can't do it here, but if you, I mean, I could put my finger, my, my angle of my pencil up to the 
screen and you can actually like sight the angle of that nose and make sure that this angle is exactly this angle. No bellus. Um, Kai, do you have a, um, a tortillion or a smudger? A blending stump? Yes. One of these, you have one of these guys? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and the reason, the reason I want this is because um, I, I kind of want to show, like if you look at the inside of the eye socket, it's all tone in here. And there's not really much line. So in order, you have to draw like the left side of the nose, which is a line. And then the right side of the bridge of the nose is like a tone. So, you know, when you use lines, when it's only tone, it's kind of screws up the drawing sometimes. Like it, <clears throat> it really does. Um, and then going back to that original notion of um, whether we're going to use, uh, whether we're going to use um, details or general, um, in order to draw this properly, to re really see it, um, I'm going to have to zoom in. I'm going to have to zoom in like hardcore. And I'm excited to do that because there's another technique, which I'll talk about later, um, which is you use an iPad and it, you can like zoom in really hard, um, you know, as you're drawing. Um, it's in the form of a camera lucida. Anyway, so I want to get a general placement of eyes, nose, mouth, so that I can come back in and like really detail um, what's going on inside those eyes, really detail the nose. And then of course the lips. I mean, I think the lips in this particular piece, I mean, the nose is really good, but the lips are like really good. Um, um, Botticelli was like a, a early to mid Renaissance um, Italian painter. Um, he like just missed the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle cut. You know, like it's mm -hmm. like Donatello, Michelangelo, Raphael. Leonardo, like Botticelli would be like the next one. Um, and he actually kind of came before and set the stage for a lot of those guys. Um, anyway, um, so again, I'm just gonna try and place, generally speaking, um, some of these ideas. And if I can use line where line is there, that's good. If I have to use tone, then I'll switch over to my tortillion. Um, okay, and actually, that's the one thing I was going to say is like, I've, I loaded the, the tortillion over here. I'm wondering if I should just, without doing any details, just like put in the shadow underneath that nose. Oh my gosh. And then come down into the, the septum and then into the philtrum and then do that line where the lips are touching. Now, this is like the most generic um, indication, but um, for our sake to like get the things placed and then to be able to zoom, zoom in. Yeah, zoom in um, to see the details, that'll be huge. So um, side note, which will be really good. Um, a lot of time when you see people's faces, and I've done, I think I've sketched this, sketched this for you before, but if it's a profile, you have forehead and you have the brow ridge. And then you have the nose, front of the nose, underside of the nose. And there's the upper lip, lower lip, and then chin. So this is like a profile of you, you know, of a human. Um, here's the cheekbone right here. So if the light's coming from up above, all of the planes that angle towards the ground, those get shadows and darker tones. So underneath the eyebrow ridge, underneath the nose, the upper lip is in shadow. Then you know, the, you know, this lip, the, the, from the lip to the chin, that angles towards the ground. This upper lip angles towards the ground. The nose angles towards the ground. The brow ridge angles towards the ground. All of those parts are not receiving the light because they overhang. So the underside is in shadow. And then finally, the underside of the chin. So a lot of times when I'm trying to place, <clears throat> I'm trying to place where my features are. Like when I remember when I just shaded that nose right there, 
that little under undershadow, the upper lip undershadow, beneath the the lip and the chin, and then finally the chin. <clears throat> that can be really a helpful way of marking where stuff is. So again, um, inside this eye socket, underneath the nose, underneath the lip, underneath you know, between the lip and the chin. And then he's got like a, a peach chin and he's got a cleft in the middle. <clears throat> cool. All right. I don't want to get, I don't want to block out too much more because I haven't done the eyes. I don't know where Jack, I just don't know where anything is. So, rectangle. You didn't close this off, did you? I got an ad. Okay, we're getting close, babe. This chicken's almost done. Now, the I'm gonna okay, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm not gonna zoom in just yet. I wanna see if I can place the uh, the little triangle of the tear duct. So the way you get to the tear ducts is you follow the keystone. Um, this is the unibrow part that starts in the middle, and then you angle down, and then you just follow that shadow until it gets light. And this is like this little moat, it's like a little gutter around the um, teardrop or triangle shape of the tear duct. It's right in here. Botticelli gives us like kind of a try, more of a triangle. And then we're going to get the upper eyelid and then the lower eyelid wrapping around. <clears throat> There's an epic fold up here as the eyes open. Oh, it's interesting because so the way that he does it, and this is not how everybody does it, but this fold that we just, you know, blocked in, that actually connects into this moat. You know, it's like this border around the tear duct. I like that. Um, this fold is actually going to wrap around into our sausage. And it's like breakfast sausage because it's cylindrical out here. It swells out. And that's going to come back in. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a man angel. Um, so a lot of times the brow ridge take on, you know, slightly more linear properties rather than cur curving properties. Um, it's just, he's, it's, it's also young. He's also angelic. So like there's a lot of curves in here, especially in the mouth. Um, but, you know, straight lines tend to be emphasized in more masculine figures and curvilinear elements in more feminine figures. And obviously there's exceptions to all of those rules. Um, before we get a chance to zoom in um, for the detail, um, the, the tear duct on the other side, unfortunately, is so low um, and the nose comes out so much that we don't see it. Um, so we have to like use our x-ray vision and look beyond, you know, look through the bridge of the nose and imagine where that triangle, the tear duct is. And then we can pull the upper eyelid up across and then back down. And then the lower eyelid will go angle down, wrap around the belly of the eyeball. It wraps around. <clears throat> cool. Um, I guess on both accounts, you can see, you know, the thickness of the top shelf of the eyelid, and you can also see the covering, you know, of the of the lower eyelid. Really prominent, actually. So what I'm going to do on this side is the front of that eyelid, which is again probably mostly tone. And then we'll get the, the fold. He's got kind of um, a large space in between the eyelashes of the upper eyelid and the fold, which I think is a, uh, could be a beauty principle. Um, I think in a, when I say beauty, I mean more in like a classical sense. I think the a significant visible upper eyelid 
um, I think is a, a very typical um, standard in classical art. Um, Renaissance art was not classical in that in the sense that um, it was in the 1500s, they were rediscovering a lot of ancient Greek and Roman sculptures. So true classical was in ancient times from about 500 BC to roughly zero AD, uh, you know, around the time of Christ. And then, then that's when kind of the dark ages began. Um, and then humanity reemerged out of the dark ages, kind of in the beginning of uh, the middle ages around Charlemagne, which is like 900 to 1000 AD. And then 500 years after that, you know, 400 to 500 is when the Renaissance hit in Italy. And they discovered all kinds of antiquity and literature, um, Greek philosophy. Um, so it's classicism is a throwback. Um, so the Renaissance seems really old to us, five, 600 years ago. And for them, their classical era, the, their golden age was 1500 years before that. So in a way, this is the, his Botticelli's um, is a reinterpreting uh, classical art in this Renaissance period. Um, that timeline is very, took a long time for me to get straight because um, um, people refer to classical art and they uh, refer to neoclassical art, which was um, the Renaissance art is kind of truly the original neoclassical, but then the French rehashed it again in like the 1800s. <laughs> Um, it, you know, so these older ideas, ancient ideas, um, keep resurfacing kind of in fresh new ways because, you yeah, know, they're pretty solid. <clears throat> um, okay, so um, back to the fold. So, yeah, and a lot of these classical, like ancient sculptures had these prominent upper eyelids. Um, my upper eyelid and my eyelashes, I have big brown eyelashes and they come up over. So it doesn't even, most of the time when I'm drawing self portraits, I can barely see the fold. Like this fold that's above the eye um, just blends right into my eyelashes. Um, in a way it's easier. In another sense, it's um, you know, more difficult. I guess I guess it could close my eyes a little bit. Um, all right, so where this fold turned up and then go went back into the brow, the same thing kind of happens on this side, except everything's shorter because the far side of the face is um, foreshortened. So it's, um, at a, it's at a funky angle. Cool. All right, so this is where um, I think I'm going to zoom in so that we can really um, focus on these eyes. And if we get the eyes right, you'll be surprised. I mean, I think the whole rest of my face is off. Like my nose looks small, my mouth looks in the wrong place. Um, I did graphite, so luckily um, I can change it all. So you have to get something that looks like a face just so you can get started. Um, and then almost it's almost all changed. Okay. Um, yeah, Kristen, I need you to take the chicken off. Are you in a position to do that? Yes. Nice. Things are gonna be so good. <laughs> and it will focus in one second. Yes, there it goes. Uh, yeah, I'd put it right on top of the bacon. Just put it on top of the bacon and then wrap the foil on top and just let it rest. <clears throat> I'll turn it off right now. It's off. So yeah, Kai, the smoker is completely smart. So it's like, it's all, I don't even, you can't even turn it on unless you have it attached to your phone, your smartphone. It's, it's ridiculously awesome. <clears throat> all right, I'm not accepting this level of focus. So I'm gonna zoom in and let it get adjusted. And then usually it stays there. 
Okay, I can go a little closer. Bella, please. Okay, watch this. I'm just gonna hold it. Just keep the um, tear duct on the other side. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Okay, so that should be, that's pretty good. My angles might be off, but that's okay. So this, I gave the dog some of the bacon and she just cannot stay away. <laughs> um, okay, groovy, let's do this bad boy. All right, so already off the bat, I can tell that like my angle of my um, tear duct is not steep enough. So I'm going to steepen it and I think I'm going to lighten it. And then instead of drawing, I don't know if you can see this, but instead of like, he drew two, two light lines to define the top shelf of the upper eyelid. Here, he doesn't draw the thickness. He uses a single line and he just makes that line nice and thick. I think that's like, I mean, that's like, it's almost like the lazy man's way, but like, why not? I mean, he's trying to show that there's an under ledge. And then this is where, I don't know if you can see this, but this is where it really becomes like a sculpture. So you can actually see the outline of the silhouette of the iris as if it were a sculpture. So the light is coming from the left. So the light's coming from up here. Um, so the inside of the eye socket, excuse me, the inside of the eyelid is going to be dark. And as that travels over towards the corner of the eye, the iris gives you a shadow. So the side of the iris is in fact a shadow. I put it in the wrong place. But um, instead of drawing the side of the iris like in a human eye, you're actually showing like um, like the height, the elevation of the of like the stone or the marble, and then there is a quiet distinction between the edge of the iris and the sclera on the left side, but it's really faint. Do you see it in there? It's like so faint. The line that I have in there is already um, too dark. All right. So then the inside of the eye socket is the side of the eyeball, and the pupil itself looks like it's made up of a dark circle like a u-shape u-shaped lip and then you get a shallow carving so it's like the inside is like a gray wow the iris itself looks like it's got some uh tone to it the tone is not as dark as the lines that define the edge of it. And then this is the cool part. So there's a deeper shadow in this like crevice in between the side of the eyeball and the, and the eyelid. That little dark note right there. Awesome. Okay, so the even though it's the white of the eye, you know, the sclera of the eye, I'm looking at this shape right here, um, because it turns away from the light source, um, it's going to be darker than the eyelid. So I'm going to shade the gray in there. He gives us some like straight lines, you know, almost like some hatchwork. And the, and the only way we can make this um, eyelid, the lower eyelid stand out is by shading everything around it. So the eyeball, the, 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 the sclera of the eyeball has to be in shadow. And then the, um, the lower part of the eyelid has to be in shadow so that the top of the eyelid is light. And that's like a tricky, it's like a tricky kind of thing. How do you get the light? Well, you shade dark on both sides.
I have all this real estate over here. Okay, so we look at the, yeah, let's just complete that lower eyelid. So we're gonna bring that lower eyelid all the way back along the bottom of the iris, and it's gonna connect back into the tear duct. That looks good. <clears throat> There's one little detail that I kind of don't know how to do. I think, I think you see that little highlight that there's a little white, the highlight of the lower lid is here. And then there's a highlight actually on the bottom part near the pupil. So maybe I have to erase near the, the moment that goes right up against the pupil. So that stands out. I mean, that's like some super subtle stuff. Super subtle. <clears throat> um, for me, that's like, that's, I, I love those little, those little details. I love getting inside these artists' heads and see how they make decisions. Um, I wanna do this upper eyelid and I wanna see that it's like a rain, that it's sort of like, the, um, the shape I'm looking for is, I always call it a bridge, like a rainbow bridge. Just imagine this is the, a, like a, a bridge and then this is the, the thickness of the wood. And then, you know, there's railings on this side and there's like railings over here, you know, connect to the railing. So it's like a little, my grandfather had this little stream in his backyard and he built himself this little footbridge. I mean, it's probably like three feet, um, you know, like, like wood panels or whatever. Anyway, there's this like, this is the stream that runs underneath it. Um, I know it seems like a long explanation, but the light is coming from the left side. So the light is hitting the whole left side of the bridge. And as the arc comes up and travels onto the other side, it starts to go in shadow more. And in fact, this path, if it kept going, would be you know in real shadow. Um, in this situation, this is the eyelid. So the the side of the bridge is the upper eyelid, um, you know where the eyelashes come. And then the left side of the eyelid is light, and then the right side's in shadow. So what I just drew is you know this bridge that comes you know the path that comes up, curls across the eyeball, goes down the other side of the bridge, and then travels into. Um, you know, the shadow part of the sausage up here. All right, so instead of building like the wood that would come across, I'm gonna use shading that runs this way. Just cause that, I feel like that's the type of covering and it also echoes the direction um, of this fold. And the fold and the, the eyelid isn't dark, it's the sausage, it's the bottom of the sausage that's actually dark. And we're gonna see how that occurs similarly um, in the mouth. So this, the line that we use as the placeholder, it really is the connecting point between the sausage and that upper eyelid. We're gonna follow this eyelid back up and then come back down in. And then we'll do some shading in here. Wow, nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Miss Foley. Hello. Can you hear me yet? Yeah. Good. Cool. Well, we, um, we got down to business. I don't know if you can see this, but we started drawing this um, Renaissance eyeball by Botticelli. Um, let's see. Um, do you want to try and catch up? Yeah. All right, sweet. I think you'll be able to. Um, I might have to zoom out here for a second. And, you know, maybe this would be a good time. If, I don't know if, um, Kai, I don't know if I was going too fast or whatever, but you can have a moment to, um, you know, catch up, I suppose. 
Um, always take like a screenshot if I zoom in like that and it's like good content. Um, take a screenshot so you don't miss the details. Um, all right, so Julia, what we started with was um, this, I'm just gonna overdo it right here, but we did the keystone right here, which we've done before. Um, did the side plane and the inside of the socket is really shaded. And then it, it really pleasantly comes up into this like light, I call it a moat, but it's really just like this border around the triangle of the tear duct. So we have a Y shape, left side, right side of the keystone. And then you have the side of the eye socket leads us in. And then you have the, um, this little border around the tear duct. And then you get the triangle of the tear duct. From there, we're gonna do the upper eyelid in kind of a rainbow for fashion, lower eyelid wraps around and we're, we're drawing the part of the eyelids that touch the eyeball. Um, we extended the thickness of that skin. And I actually think, I actually have a hunch um, um, that it's, he's actually drawing um, a sculpture of a purse of a, of a purse of an angel and not a person representing an, uh, you know, an angel. So either he's using like the sculpted type of format to make this, this character feel more like an angel, or he's actually maybe even using an example of a sculpture um, in order to draw a person. I never even thought of that. I mean, he could have been sketching from an ancient, uh, you know, an ancient sculpture that was like unearthed or whatever a lot of those ancient Greek sculptures were unearthed in the, in the Renaissance period. <clears throat> um, so how about this? Um, well, really quickly, what we really needed, the other thing is, is before we got into the details of all of those characteristics, um, we had to get the relationship between the tear ducts. And the face is like, the head is really angled hard. So when you find the angle of the bridge of the nose, which, you know, springs exactly from the keystone. So if you have the keystone, then you have the angle of the nose. Um, the tear duct for this left eye is actually uh, behind uh, the nose itself. So I just, I just put that tear duct in there so that I could then get the, I could then launch um, my eyebrow not my eyebrow, what am I talking about? My eyelid coming across um, the eyeball. And then for some reason, I was like thinking of um, a belt loop. And when I was like drawing the eyelid that, that was touching the eyeball on this left side, it just felt like it wrapped around, it was almost like a waistband or a, yeah, like a belt. The way, the way a belt would go across the front and then turn around to the back. Um, I, this, it's so interesting because there is a famous self-portrait by Botticelli um, and it looks kind of like this angel. Um, but as you guys know, I mean, all art is a self-portrait. So if he was inventing any aspect of this, or if he was, you know, you can't help but put your own kind of characteristics into, uh, you know, a picture. So um, the fact that it does look a little bit like the self-portrait by Botticelli, um, I feel like that's very natural. I'm not saying that this is a self-portrait, um, but I might try to cross-reference it and see if, that, if, I, if I'm on to anything. Um, okay. So yeah, so what we did is we had the keystone, uh, we came in down the socket, we found the moat around the tear duct, so we could place that tear duct, upper eyelid, lower eyelid, um, fold, and then sausage, and then that sausage went back into the keystone. Um, the keystone on the far side, um, we don't have the advantage of seeing the tear duct, so we're going to imagine where it is behind this brow ridge, and then we're going to do the same process. We're going to do the upper eyelid wrapping around, lower eyelid wrapping around and its thickness. Um, and then between those lids, just like we did up here on the right side, we need to um, place the iris. 
And the iris is obviously the color portion, blue, brown, uh, green. I did a portrait of a, I did a portrait of a, a girl. Let me show you. Uh, she was really, she was, it was a somewhat of a commission actually. Um, it was one of my students, uh, one of my students' granddaughters. And you couldn't tell what color her eyes were um, from the picture, but it turns out their eyes were green. And so I put a little green tint, a uh, hint of the green in her, her eyes. Where's that portrait? Okay, here it is. You might not be able to see it, but it's a, uh, it was a thin, it was a, it was a very delicate sketch. Um, can you see the little hint of the green on there? Um, this was a whole another method um, of drawing that um, this fellow wanted to learn how to do. Um, so it's just black and white. Uh, it's just graphite and white chalk on, you know, a tone, a toned brown paper. Um, and the method is is actually similar to um, what's going on here, which is uh, silver point. Um, prepared paper. When you draw with silver, uh, it's a metal. It's a gray. Um, it's very similar to graphite. And then you can use um, gouache, like white white chalk highlights. Um, on that prepared paper as well. And I think some of the highlights do show up um, in the cheeks um, and in some of these uh, eyelids. That's not how we're drawing right now, but um, even so, it's, it's the silver point, if you get the chance, um, it's just a wonderful medium. Just, just naturally beautiful. <clears throat> um, yeah, I've also noticed too that some of these guys, um, will not put the pupil in the middle um even though that's anatomically that's where it is um there's something about the, the you know the certain generation of uh artists that would put it higher so that there'd be more at the bottom and i think i mean that's definitely how i'm seeing both the one on the right and the left and i'm just noticing that and i wonder what that effect is i don't know if it makes it feel like the eyeball is moving um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. See more examples. But that is definitely a, uh, a, a thing. Um, Julia, I was also saying when I did this, upper, uh, this other eyelid that as we sketched that, instead of drawing the thickness um, of the eyelid with two lines, you know, top and a bottom and then filling it in, I, I mean, I think he just did one line and then made it really thick. Um, an efficient way of doing it. Um, there seems to be some shading going on on the inside of the sclera. And then also at the very top up here where the upper eyelid throws a shadow onto the eyeball. Mm -hmm. I've got this fold. Um, and then we have the shadows of the underside of the brow ridge. So the top of the brow ridge, um, both this little moment, I'll just circle it right here. That little moment is light. And then this moment up here is pretty light. Um, the rest of it has a has kind of a gray tint to it. It has been addressed with um, some kind of shading. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, for some reason, I, it seems that I'm making the, uh, I haven't really gotten to the silhouette, um, but I should. And I think that my, my upper, my eyebrow, my eyebrows just feel small on both sides. And um, they, they, they kind of cut under sharply and give that sense of hair, even though I don't think that there's you know, any express 
I don't think there's any expression of literal hair, um, but there is some darker tones. Looks like I need to just really tone down some of my lines because the darkest parts are the upper eyelid. <coughs> you know, the underplane. And if you start making the rest of the lines as dark as the, the darkest line, then the darkest line ceases to be dark. It just it, you know, feels, feels like all the rest. So I'm gonna lighten and soften some of my other lines just so I can like maintain um, that punch of that, uh, that contrast. Graphite, let's see, look at when I tilt it like this. Do you see how my the right side eye gets darker? Um, it's because the graphite is metal. And so the way it's, it's at, this looks like it's a lighter gray. It's really not. It's just actually reflecting the light. So as, as I bend it, you can actually get a better sense of my, uh, my values. <coughs> nice. I have this horrible habit. I'm not using my tortillion and just, um, just like freehanding the tone. That is a, you know, that's probably the way, I mean, it's, there's no right way or wrong way. It's just, um, I, I always, I, I just, this is a bad habit. It's a bad habit of not utilizing it. Um, and then I, you know, then I remember it halfway through the drawing and then it's like, oh, why didn't I use this from the very beginning? Um, yeah. So use your tortillion. It's such a wonderful, it's just a great, uh, it's just such a great tool. And everyone used it. Like all the great artists like employed the tool. <clears throat> I think there's some teachers that are kind of adverse to it because somehow it like, it feels like it's cheating because it looks so good. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Do everything you can to make your art look good. <clears throat> It's, I mean, it's hard enough. Um, okay, so I want to kind of get into the, kind of want to get into the nose. I may pop, you know, pop some of my darks or whatever, but not really. Um, I'm going to get into the nose. Um, and the nose is kind of in, you know, is really only in like, there's only like four parts of the nose. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll, and I'll, and I will try to keep it simple. It's just, the fact that it, it, it takes it's so like so few people explain it uh, this way is really annoying. Um, but let's let's just get into it. So the keystone is this form up here, and that leads into the first portion, which is called the bridge of the nose. Um, and that is basically a parenthesis. It's it's where the the cartilage meets. Um, it's where the bone meets the cartilage, and it, and it, you know it swells out. Um, that bridge of the nose transitions. Um, into what we call the ball of the nose. Um, the ball of the nose is kind of a misnomer. It's kind of like a chin. So if you, if I zoom up a little bit here, um, the chin has a cleft in it. Um, and it's because there's a bone on the right, a jawbone on the right that meets the jawbone on the left. And here you can see the division between those two components. Most people, the chin is like a singular object. It's like one, orb or egg or a ball or whatever. It's really two things that have joined in the middle and you don't notice them. <clears throat> um, the ball of the nose is the same thing. So um, I think I can zoom in slightly and still maintain the presence of the eyes. Um, you know, not crop the eyes too much. Um, so here, here's how you want to think about the nose. Think about the ball of the nose like the chin, where it's one object, um, but really it's the right side cartilage meeting with the left side cartilage. 
And some people have actually a cleft in the middle of their nose. And if you feel your nose, if you touch the middle of your nose, you can feel the bump. There's a right side and a left side. And that there's a little, you know, it gives, um, even though you've never noticed it. It's, there's, you have two noses. It's basically one, or there's a nostril on the right that meets the nostril on the left. And the bridge of the nose meets in the middle. So it seems like it's one nose, but it's two fused components. <clears throat> okay, so we have the left side ball, the right side ball, and then both of those um, meet in the middle and are resting on what I call a pedestal, which is actually the septum. So this little piece of cartilage that's in the middle um, that separates the two nostrils, that is what, um, you know, in a, like the bull, the ring that goes in a bull's nose, or I guess it's, there's even piercings that go in there. <clears throat> so that is the septum. And that's um, you know, an important characteristic because then that, once you have the angle of the septum, that's the underside of the nose. And then you can strategically place the uh, nostril hole. And the nostril hole in this Botticelli, um, the nostril on the right is more of like a bean shape. And I'll show you what I mean by a bean. So if you look in here, that's the bean. <clears throat> now, you, the way you want to think about the nostril hole is like a toilet paper roll. So our bean is the inside of the toilet paper roll. And then the outside is the thickness. The thickness of that uh, nostril is the thickness of the toilet paper, however much toilet paper is on the roll. And then the nostril flare as it comes up the side that becomes the side of the toilet paper. You know, the toilet paper rolls off this way, perforated edges. <clears throat> so that's the symbolic uh, metaphor for the nostril. Um, and it seems uh, silly, but it's uh, very helpful. Side plane <clears throat> and the, as far as the left side nostril, the left side nostril is even more of a toilet paper roll than you can imagine. So the left side nostril, you see the inside of the toilet paper roll. Then you see the thickness of that toilet paper roll. And then you catch a little bit of the side. I mean, it's just such a useful way of thinking about, um, you know, human anatomy, facial anatomy. Um, I'm going to erase the, um, the placeholder of the base of the keystone as well as the, um, you know, the tear duct. The tear duct just gets, gets lost now. No longer necessary. I mean, I feel like how we drew this nose should go viral because that was like so helpful. Um, we're below looking up at this nose. Um, uh, Julia, the light is coming from the upper left. So um, the nose is a solid object. So it's actually blocking um, some light from hitting uh, the cheek. So you can throw that cast shadow. That, there's a little bit of this shadow that really makes that nostril, um, you know, separated from the face, you know, this dark line here. And this is where I would, again, use my diffuser or my tortillion, um, tortillon to diffuse it. Uh, the tortillon, uh, the blending stump, it's so uh, much like painting. You know, when you're painting um, oil paint, that is, um, the paint is on the surface and it doesn't, it takes a long time to dry, which is the advantage. So you can, you know, manipulate the, pa the paint as it's on the surface, very similarly as you can manipulate the um, the pigment of graphite, you know, just because it's on the paper doesn't mean you can't move it around, and that's what the uh, that's what the tor the the blending stump does. It makes, allows you to blend the pigment that's there. Um, it can also, you know, be very useful for corrections and to hide mistakes. But you want to face your mistakes head on. It's generally a good rule.
Hmm. Nice. I'm so annoyed at this light, the way the light's going. My whole drawing has this that has this punch, but you can't see it because it's reflecting too much. <clears throat> and you know, if I'm going too fast, I can email everybody the uh Julia join. Yeah, Julia's in the house. Oh, yeah. Um I can email you the video. <clears throat> it took me so many tries. I'm still going. I'm trying to draw this far side of the the silhouetted edge of the uh, nose, the ball of the nose. Graphite is so nice. It's so nice to you if you um, <laughs> you can get so many tries, many tries and retries. How's the chicken look? Does it look good though? Was the skin crispy? I think so. I didn't really pay attention. Okay. I hope that skin is crispy. I hope it doesn't get soggy from being in the grill. I don't think it will. Um, all right. So um, one of the reasons I chose this um, was because of how mm, like amazing the uh, the lips are. And the, the one of the thing, the biggest issues um, with drawing faces is getting from the major areas um, through the minor areas into other major areas. So when I say that you get one eye and you have to go, you know, you start with the keystone, which nobody ever thinks about the space between the eyes. In order to get the eyes set up, you have to do the space between the eyes. In order to get to these wonderful nostrils, you have to get through the bridge of the nose, the ball of the nose, the septum, just to get to the nostrils. Everyone knows where the nostrils are. Now, in order to get down to the mouth, um, we have to go through the philtrum. And the philtrum starts um, in the middle um, at the septum. So if you follow this little track um, from the septum, you get this little, it's like a little gutter. Um, so where the upper lip meets the upper, the, the upper lip on the right meets the upper lip on the left. And then that takes you to what is known as Cupid's bow. So this arrow, um, um, and, and he de-emphasizes it. It's actually a light um, uh, arrow pointing down. So you have kind of like this dark uh, shaft of the gutter of the septum. And then you have this like the white arrow tip. There's a light arrow tip right here. I'm going to overdo it. Um, and it points down and that gets you the middle of the upper lip and the middle of the upper lip <clears throat> is a really delightful form. It's this guy right here. Um, and it can be seen a couple different ways. It can be seen as a sphere. It can be seen as a bean, you know, bean, the bean might be kind of most useful for this one. It can also be seen as an open book. So I'll just sketch it over here. So Cupid's bow goes points down. And then you have the binding of the book and then the book opens on the left, opens on the right. So then this would be, you know, that's the open book. So the pages are up here. <clears throat> Can you kind of see that, how this angles up here and then angles up on that side? <clears throat> anyway, I think I made it a little too large, but I'm, I'm cool with it. This, this form of the middle of the upper lip is not without, uh, not without wings. So as this bean comes up, we are going to follow the wing of this upper lip into the teardrop corner of the mouth. So I like to see this whole side, it's in shadow. I like to see that as a, as a wing. And then the other side of the bean has a wing as well. It's just going to be angled away from us. So it is in foreshortening in the same way that the angle of the face on the left. Um, I need to make it dip down even more. It's amazing. So this comes up and then it dips down hard. Um, in the same way, the angle of the eyes, the tear duct to tear duct is a really steep angle. Boom, 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 boom. Um, that I actually probably should have made this nostril even a steeper angle, noticing that is an issue here. And then this lip 
um, corner to corner, it goes way low. Um, and then you look at the wing on this side, it comes up and then it cuts down so hard. <clears throat> Wonderful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this lip, you know, the, the winged bean is resting on top of a peanut. So there's a swelling on the right, a swelling on the left, and it meets in the middle. So a peanut has a peanut on this side, peanut on this side, and the shell connects. You want to go down? Okay. Go down. I'm not gonna give you any more bacon. I gave I gave the dogs way too much bacon. This is your fault. I shouldn't give them any. I mean, I didn't give them too much. I just gave them the fact that I gave them any at all was the problem. Wow, so neat. Um, I'm not getting. I'm I'm not getting something right. So, I think the whole angle of the lips is just not steep enough, both on the left or the right. And I may not even have enough room. That might be my issue too. I underestimated the distance between the, the philtrum. I estimated the size of, I estimate, I underestimated the size of the septum. And then all, consequently the philtrum. All right, I'm only human. <clears throat> okay, so I've got this little skinny philtrum coming from the septum. And then Cupid's bow is a little bit lower. And since I did not get the thickness correct or the angle correct, I'm going to try to get it right this time. So I'm going to over exaggerate what my original tendency was. So I made it a little bit longer, which I'm feeling good. And then the middle of the bean and then the wing on the left. Up back down in the corner of the mouth. <laughs> no, it's too much. Cracks me up. <clears throat> um, okay, there's also, yeah, so that looks good. All right, so I got that. And then there's some shadow on the underside. A lot of shadow on the underside. Um, Julia, look up here real quick. This is a sketch that I made um, of the profile of the face. So all the planes that angle to the ground are in shadow. So where we are right now is this, this is the upper lip right here leading into the corner of the mouth. Um, so that is why it's so dark. And then you have the bean underneath it. And then you have the shadow underneath the bean getting to the chin and then the underside of the chin will be in shadow. So hopefully that, uh, oh, I took the wrong piece of paper out. <clears throat> So that's why the underside of the lip gets all the shadow because it really does angle towards the ground. And then I'll rest that beautiful flying bean on top of my peanut. That links up in the middle, corner of the mouth. <clears throat> and really a um, part of the thing that really I'll zoom back out, but <clears throat> part of what makes him look masculine is the, um, you know, the size and structure of the, uh, of his chin. So the, his chin is really quite large. And just like that, we followed the middle of the nose, the two sides of the orbs down to the middle of the philtrum, find the middle of the septum, septum, philtrum, um, middle of the upper lip. You see the connection of the two beans. We're gonna go down through the upper lip into the top of the chin, and that top of the chin will lead us into the cleft, which is the, this, you know, the, this dot right here, which is where the left side of the jaw meets the right side of the jaw. And we're gonna basically draw like a peach or you know, just a, a further extension of the, um, 
you know, a very similar form as the ball of the nose. So there's going to be a swelling on the right, which goes in shadow, swelling on the left, which goes in shadow. And then all this tone underneath that lip, which is in shadow. Get my tortillion, smooth out some of that action. And the spirit of graphite, going to eliminate what I don't need to these lines at the top of the chin. <clears throat> All right, um, right before we do this silhouette, and honestly, the silhouette is gonna be the last thing that we need to, need to do. Um, before we get to that, um, that beautiful connection between the sausage on the left and the, the chin at the very bottom. Um, the, the, both the nose and the mouth have these secondary gutters and secondary characteristics that are very subtle that a lot of people don't think about. Um, one of them is this crease. Um, it's called the nasal labial fold. And it's this crease that you want to not overdo. And, and children and women, you definitely don't want to kind of show it. Um, but it's like, if you, you can sc scrunch your nose, you can create those creases. You know, they come, they're basically start from behind the nostril and angle down. Um, and that, you know, if there's tears or there's drops, it's a gutter that keeps things away from your nose, basically. It's a gutter on both sides. Now, in order to keep that from going, from that gunk that would drip down those tears from going into your mouth, there's two, the mouth has two swellings. Um, and they are on both sides of the uh, teardrop corner of the mouth. And it's very prominent right here, actually. So there's this extra. So did you see how I did the teardrop corner of the mouth? Um, you know, the, the darkest part of the lips where the lips are touching. Um, and then they, you know, the, the corner of the mouth is a hairpin turn. I mean, if you put on, if you open your mouth wide and put on lipstick or chapstick, the upper lip connects to the lower lip. It's the same thing. So when the lips are closed, you know, it's a, an immediate abrupt turn from this upper lip here to the lower lip there. Now there's all this extra shadow over on this far side on the outside of the teardrop corner of the mouth. Now the teardrop corner of the mouth here, there's that is this secondary form, which is um, created, you know, to create this gutter, yes, um, it's also a connection, um, a swelling of muscles. So there's a muscle that comes from below on the jaw. There's a muscle that comes up from the upper lip and then the one that comes from the lower lip. So there's these two little, and you want to de-emphasize them. Um, you know, if you like in, you know, in, in women and children, especially, because it, if you add too much shadow there, it can be confused with you know, facial hair. Um, and actually, yeah, mustache hair does end at that point. Like that point is where, you know, if I were to give this guy a mustache, that is where the mustache portion of the, the hair ends. And then like, you know, the goatee or the chin hair would, you know, begin. Okay, so it's this gutter up here by the nose. And then the swelling at the corner of the mouth, which is creating, you know, really in this composition, it's really the ex explanation for this shadow that's in the corner of the mouth right there. And I guess it's the explanation for the highlight on the other side. That makes sense. Okay. So yeah, there's a highlight on this side and a shadow on the other side. Cool. Oh, girls, we're so close. We're so close to being finished. Um, um, and then we can kind of add some tones where we see them. Um, I'm going to zoom out here. And unfortunately, he doesn't give us um, I think there's probably another, this was a drawing for a composition that I think was, he didn't need anything. Like he didn't need the ear. He didn't need the hair. I think something was covering it up on this side, which is why he didn't do it. But um, there's a cheekbone on the right and there's going to be a cheekbone on the left. And we're going to have like the fleshy part of the cheek, which is right here. That's going to show up down here. And he's lean, you know, this guy's lean. So um, you know, it's not like he's got baby fat, um, you know, where the cheeks are really round. 
Um, but you still have to like know what you're looking at from this cheekbone down into this jaw and then ultimately from the jaw into the chin. Um, and so that's, so, that, so that's what's happening. So let me just draw it up here. Um, we're trying to link up the sausage, which is right here, down to the chin, which we just found out where it is because we just drew that, you know, the rounded part of the chin. So we have to name the anatomy. So first things first, we're gonna do the temple. So there's a straight line for the temple, that side, this side, and we get the cheekbone, which is this kind of gentle bow, gentle bowing shape. It's like a, it's a curve. It's flesh on top of bone. Um, and then the next phase, see how it dips in a little bit right here? That's where the bone transitions into the fleshy part of the cheek. Um, I would even I would make a case that you don't get to see the this the the this swelling at the corner of the of the um, mouth does not affect the silhouetted edge. Sometimes um, it will. Sometimes this this muscle at the corner of the mouth will actually show up in the um, the contour of the face, the silhouette face. But I'm I'm claiming that it doesn't. And then, so this is this one kind of long arc for the fleshy part of the cheek, which is, you know, largely a straight line. It's not as curvy as the cheekbone. Um, and then we need to use the, like, the jaw. If you like rest your hands, like you're going for like a, uh, you know, like an autumn photo shoot and you're sitting in a pile of leaves on your stomach and you put your hands like this and you're resting your chin on your hands that your jaw and your knuckles are basically touching. There's like almost no flesh in between them. So your jaw, the point I'm trying to make is that your jaw bone, regardless of um, your know, body fat percentage comes very close to the surface of the skin. Um, your cheeks can swell, your double chin can swell, but your jaw line generally holds up and um, is close. And that's what this last little connection is the fleshy part of the cheek into the uh, chin. There's this straight line. So if I broke it into these separate units, we'll go sausage one, temple two, cheekbone three, fleshy part of the cheek four, jawbone five, and then chin six. <clears throat> it's really, um, you know, most people would see this and they would like think this is one continuous line. And ultimately, I think that's how he draws it. But you can tell that he's subdividing those anatomical parts and he's naming them um, so that he doesn't screw it up. And so that it looks like a, a looks like a, you know, a human being and registers as a human being. So the thing that I like to do next, and even though he doesn't quite do it, is once you, it's very obvious where these things are to me, just because I named them. The right side doesn't have um, that explanation in lines; it has it through tone. So if I were to shade this edge, cheek um, temples, which would happen back here. Then that cheekbone comes all the way from back here, wraps around to the front. Then we get the fleshy part of the cheek. And then we'll have the jaw. You're just picking up on all of these silhouetted edges. You're seeing them in a, in a tonal way on this far side. And then you know, into that chin. Seeing how the underside of this lip joins with the swelling on that corner of the mouth and then into the fleshy part of the cheek and the fleshy part of the cheek joins into the jaw in this blend and then this blending jaw turns into the side of the chin bone. Cool. Um, oh, wait, sorry, Julia, I, I missed it. We hold it up again.
Miss Foley, will you hold it up again? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. I was talking to my brother. Oh, dude, dude you held it up there, right? I didn't did know. Oh, sorry. There's a, I, there's, I there had, might be a drawing on the it. back. Yeah, there's a drawing on the back of that. Wow, cool. Look at all those tries. Loving it. <laughs> um, it looked like it was kind of frustrating, though. Are you, are you freaking yeah. out? Are you freaking? Faces are hard. Yeah, they are definitely a little hard. Um, but like I said, I can send this, I can send this video over to you. Um, or we can just like live to fight another day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just looking at some other places where there might be some shading. There's even shading on the far side of the face. That's interesting. <clears throat> like, and the more shading you do, the more um, the more masculine it looks. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Shading on the side of the bridge of the nose. <clears throat> Maybe I gave him too big of a chin. So annoyed at this angle of my light. I feel like my drawing is better than it looks. I need bigger brows. All right, I'm just ruining it. Um, uh, Kai, can I see what you did? Hopefully, it was beautiful. <clears throat> um, but no pressure. Okay, so mine's kind of looks. Like a little feminine. It looks a little what? Feminine. Oh, nice. Good. I mean, he's a very feminine angel. And I think the angels have those that quality. Okay. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> so pretty. Good God, that's pretty. Wow. Okay, cool. If you want to send me a picture of that, that would be great. Um, all right. Nice. That made my day. Um, cool. Um, I'm going to go eat some chicken. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Um, send me some stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.